Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and leader of the Healthcare Practice Group at Retzel and Andrus. And today I'm joined by my favorite guest of all time, my healthcare colleague, Christina Kuda, who's also part of our healthcare group at Retzel and Andrus. And today we're going to be talking about COVID, which is a topic we haven't talked about recently, and some of the health law waivers that were put into place during COVID, whether they're still in place, and some of the misunderstandings related to those waivers, which are impacting healthcare practices today. So thanks for joining us. And I'm going to start off by just having Christina tell us a little bit about some of those waivers that went into place during COVID and how they impacted practices. Hi, everybody. So as Erica indicated, with the COVID public health emergency, uh, Medicare in particular, which is really what we're going to talk about today, sort of scrambled and CMS made a lot of changes on an emergency basis to address some of the concerns related to healthcare. Uh, deli service delivery during the COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of people are familiar with changes in the telehealth rules and being able to provide telehealth and bill for telehealth services, where before there were very tight restrictions on how that could be done and billed by Medicare. Those have been loosened while the public health emergency is still in place. Um, another large section where we saw changes related to COVID were with some services provided offsite, particularly radiology and pathology services. So for example, you might have a primary care physician practice that's contracted with a radiologist or a pathologist or a radiology or pathology group to read imaging reports or read pathology slides and provide those reports to the primary care practice. It's very common. Before COVID, there were some restrictions on how that could be done. For example, with pathology, um, CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory um, Improvements Act Amendments, does not allow a pathologist to read slides at his or her home, let's say, unless that actual home location has appropriate CLIA certifications. COVID has put a temporary stop on that and allows that to happen. The other issue is, um, and we don't have time to talk about the full Stark Law here, but as many of you know, the Stark Law impacts physician referrals, and some of the exceptions related to the Stark Law would require that a radiologist or pathologist actually provide services at the offices of the physician practice that engages or employs them. Um, the Stark Law has issued a waiver during the public health emergency for COVID and will allow some off-site services without having to have a Stark Law violation. So those are sort of the two biggest waiver we've seen with respect to on-site or off-site services in addition to the telehealth services. Okay, so now these laws, I know a lot of us don't necessarily feel we're still like in a COVID emergency, but apparently we we still are. Uh, and so are these waivers still in place right now? These waivers are absolutely still in place and they will be in place until the public health emergency declaration is over. When that will be, I don't know. I know there's some dates coming up in October, um, but those can be extended. I know there were some other waivers due to COVID like unrelated to healthcare, like the student loan payment, for example. The president's already extended that into December. So we're not sure when they'll end, but the way they're set up is they're in place until the public health emergency is over. Okay, now I know we've had some issues with our clients where they assume that because these waivers existed, that there were other waivers in place as well, and they've gotten themselves into a little bit of trouble because of these assumptions, or they misunderstood the waivers um, and thought that they applied differently. So can you speak to that? Because I think that is something that everybody's going to be really interested in hearing about. Absolutely. We've had several clients that have encountered an issue with something called the anti-markup rule. I'm going to explain a little bit about the anti-markup rule, and then I'll sort of explain the issues people have run into with the anti-markup rule and services during the COVID public health 
emergency. So the anti-market rule is a Medicare rule related only to Medicare services. And it relates to certain diagnostic services and certain pathology services. And it basically says that a practice that's billing and receiving payment from Medicare for these diagnostic or pathology services can't what we call mark up the test, which generally means they can't get more money from Medicare than what they're paying to the provider, radiologist or pathologist to provide the service, unless that radiologist or pathologist shares a practice, which is a defined a term with the billing physician. So what that essentially means is to share a practice, the radiologist or pathologist must do one of two things. Either one, provide their services on site where the physician who ordered the test regularly provides services. So in my example of the, the um, primary care practice, the primary care doctor is ordered some sort of pathology. He works in an office in, in Chicago, Illinois, and the pathologist who's contracted with the practice to read the slide or provide that professional component needs to be located in that office in Chicago, Illinois, when he or she is reading the slide in order for the markup rule to be satisfied. The second possible way to satisfy the markup rule is that that pathologist who's contracted to read the slides provides at least 75% of his or her services just for that particular primary care group. So that would mean that that pathologist has to provide a significant number of all the services they provide just for that particular primary care group, which is generally a hard task to meet. If one of those two things is not in place, then the primary care group is limited in what it can receive in Bill Medicare. So for example, if we can meet the markup rule exceptions and Medicare will pay $20 for a pathology service, for example, then the primary care group can pay the pathologist $15 for the service and essentially they've made $5. That's only if you meet the markup rule requirements. If you don't meet the markup rule requirements, that primary care group is prohibited from billing Medicare and collecting money from Medicare in excess of what it paid the pathologist. So if the pathologist gets paid $15 for his or her service, that's all the primary care group can actually bill Medicare for that service under the markup rule. Okay, makes sense. Now, just to be clear, when you're referring to a primary care group, you really mean any group under Stark that would be ordering these services from an outside provider, correct? Primary any group, care yeah, absolutely, right. any group at all. And it's with ever, any kind of billing for Medicare for the diagnostic imaging test or the pathology, I was just using primary care as an example, but absolutely. Okay, um, so now what kind of violations are you seeing then based on this anti-markup rule and people believing, you know, during uh, COVID that's it didn't apply or that it applied differently or what were, what are you thinking? Yeah, that's sort of the common conception out there is that any markup rule was waived along with all the other waivers. And really there's been no formal guidance from CMS on this point. Um, you know, we've talked to other healthcare council that are really involved in healthcare and sophisticated. And I've heard from many of them saying they think the anti market rule doesn't apply anymore because of COVID or, you know, Medicare wouldn't, wouldn't apply it for the situation. But that actually is not true. Um, we did as a firm reach out to Medicare specifically and ask about that and got formal writing from CMS that says specifically the any markup rule was not waived and it's absolutely still in force and effect. So what that means is, you know, we've had a number of physician practices who have contracts with pathology practices to read, read slides and used to do it all on site. The pathology groups have gone and said, wait a minute, during COVID, we don't want to come on site. We now can do it from our homes because CLIA's waived, Stark's waived. The things that prohibited us from doing this before no longer prohibit it. So they went to these doctors and said, hey, we're going to read from home now. And most people didn't check with legal counsel and said, okay, that's fine, read from home. The problem is most of those practices are billing Medicare and receiving payment larger than what they paid the pathology practice for the service, meaning they violated the any markup rule. And technically, all those services are considered payments that shouldn't have been made. So a lot of practices that just relied on the fact that there were these waivers in place for 
services provided offsite, assume markup rule wouldn't apply, the markup rule does still apply. And it, is, it does make sense. I talked about the CLIA waiver and the Stark waivers. Without those waivers, the pathologist could not read offsite. Any markup rule never prevented offsite reading. Before COVID or after COVID or during COVID, you could still read offsite. It just prohibited how much you could get paid for it. And if you think about it logically, if Medicare cared how much a doctor got paid for a service prior to COVID, they're still going to care how much they get paid during COVID. So it's sort of a different animal than the Stark or CLIA waivers. And uh, like I said, we do have some guidance now officially from CMS that says markup is still in effect and must be complied with while you're going through all other services during the COVID pandemic. Okay, so now this only applies when we're billing Medicare, correct? Yes. Correct. Okay, and um, what would be the repercussions now if you have found out that you failed to comply with the anti-markup rule? So all payments that you receive that didn't comply with the anti-markup rule are deemed to be overpayments. You have, as a practitioner, an affirmative obligation, once you are aware of that, to do an investigation and determine the scope of those overpayments, how many payments you received that did not meet the markup rule. And you have an affirmative obligation to inform your Medicare administrative contractor of those overpayments and actually make repayment of all those overpayments that violated the markup rule. If a provider doesn't do that and it's ever determined that those payments violated the markup rule and the provider was aware and just didn't disclose to the Medicare administrative contractor, those actually then can be deemed false claims, which kind of compounds the legal issues and also can significantly increase the fines and penalties associated with those payments other than just returning them as overpayments. Now it is possible that if a provider tries to return funds and a review is made, they may acknowledge that this perhaps wasn't, and certainly we, the legal argument would be made that, you know, there was a misunderstanding thinking that offsite was allowed during COVID under those other laws that it was incorrectly assumed that it was permitted under this law. That's certainly arguments to be made. We don't know that they would try and recoup the full amount or they would not return it uh, or some portion of it. Um, so we're really talking technically what is required. Uh, we ourselves have not yet uh, engaged in refunding these amounts, although I think it is imminent, so we can probably provide an update at a later date. And we're also not aware of any active investigations right now against any practices for having uh, improperly marked up amounts, you know, in violation of this law. Is that true? Yeah, that is accurate. I mean, there's really very little information, if anything, out there about this rule and how it applies to COVID and how it sort of worked over the past couple of years. Um, you know, my guess is CMS hasn't looked for it and it hasn't really been on their radar right now, given all the other things they've been concerned about with the public health emergency. Um, however, I certainly can conceive of audits in the future of services and requesting information to show, you know, where did that pathologist or where did that radiologist sit when he or she provided the service? And if you can't prove that they were sitting in their, um, you know, in your office when those services provided or 75% of their particular time was spent to you, you know, there's going to be an issue. And one of the one of the other things I think is important too is to look at the contracts that these uh, physician practices tend to have with the pathology groups or radiology groups. Is there an identification? Is there a compliance with the law provision? Because a lot of what we're hearing is it was the pathology groups and the radiology groups going to the practice and saying, we're not coming back. So this is what we have right. to do. And our lawyers say we can do it because of these waivers. Right. Again, I don't think anyone thought about markup or if they did, they just assumed markup would follow suit with everything else. And it looks like officially it hasn't. So, you know, if money has to be repaid back, if there are damages, is there sort of a way under that contract to, right. you know, shift that burden over to, um, you know, to those practices that. Right. Uh, so the, the that only way. party that would owe the money back is the billing entity. And right. so unless there's recoupment language or something like that in the contract with that outside provider, uh, then you're going to have to look for other legal arguments to be made. And I guess one other point we should make is that uh, you and I are involved with a lot of transactions and we always advise our clients 
to definitely make sure they're in good shape if they're looking to sell their practices. And part of that, of course, is a compliance review. Uh, these are the kind of things we would hope to find when we help our clients do a compliance review, but often these things are found during the due diligence process by a buyer. And so, of course, they can create quite a bump in the road in terms of closing a transaction uh, because this will have to be resolved before the deal can move forward. So uh, it is for anybody out there who's thinking of maybe selling their practice down the road. And we see these particular issues affecting DERM practices quite a bit, especially, and they are really a high target for purchase activity right now. So for DERM practices out there, if you're looking to sell, in particular, this is something that you really uh, should look into. And, you know, Christina's definitely happy to help you with that and answer any questions. But um, in my mind, that's where we're seeing a lot of these regulatory issues in particular coming up. Absolutely. It's always better to know about it in advance and have a plan to how it's going to be resolved and, and go to a buyer then and explain that in advance than have a buyer find the problem. It holds up the transaction. Sometimes it stops the transaction. So this is why ongoing compliance, at least annually, particularly with billing, is super important. Right. All right. Well, I think hopefully everybody out there understands uh, the issues uh, and this, again, remains an issue. So if you are doing this, you want to stop and then you want to talk to legal counsel about how to address what has already occurred. But for sure, stop doing what you're doing if you're doing it wrong. Uh, that would be the first step. And uh, definitely give us a call if you have any questions about this. Anything else you want to mention, Christina, before we wrap this up? Oh, other than, again, just if you find out there's a problem and you need assistance, we're happy to help. But ignoring the issue and just assuming no one's going to find out about it often doesn't work out well. So it's better to address it proactively than having to address it on the defense, for sure. Perfect. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's been Christina Kuda and Erica Adler at the Health Law Hotspot. Uh, we hope you enjoy this and you'll join us next time for a next our next episode. Uh, and you can see all of our past episodes at ralaw.com. Thanks for joining us. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.